Thank you for joining us today at the Midwest Dream Car Collection. We'll be sharing with you about our beautiful 1937 Cord 812 Supercharged Sportsman. Our car is finished in the factory correct color of Geneva Blue. This stunningly beautiful car was designed by Gordon Burig. Burig was a young designer with some experience in the automobile styling industry, having previously worked as a chief body designer for Duesenberg. While Burig receives most of the credit for the stylish Art Deco design car, he did have the help of his design team, which included Vince Gardner and Alex Tremulus. Now you may have heard of Alex Tremulus before, and if you have, it was most likely due to his ties in designing the historically significant 1948 Tucker. Interestingly enough, both the Cord and later the Tucker use a unique vacuum electric pre-select shifting system designed by Bendix that was controlled by a small finger operated lever mounted off the steering column. The 1936 Cord 810 and later the 1937 Cord 812 are counted as the most striking and innovative cars of their time. Mechanically, the cars were ahead of their peers. When Cord automobiles were first introduced in 1929, they were the first mass-produced automobiles offered with front-wheel drive in the United States. The elimination of the rear drive train allowed the car to be lowered so running boards were unnecessary. One of the most striking and evident features of the 1937 Cord is the very elegant Art Deco styled hood and grille. You can't help but notice the seven louvers delicately trimmed in stainless steel and the massive hood. These cars, because of the shape of the hood, look like coffins, so they're often called the coffin nose cars. A unique feature of the Cord was it was the first production, the 1936 Cord, the first production car that had the radiator completely underneath the hood. So you will not notice the radiator or radiator cap on this car, this is completely underneath the long hood. As we walk alongside the car, you'll notice the graceful swooping pontoon type front fenders that have a very crisp ridge on the top all the way down to where they meet the door. You'll also notice the large exhaust pipes coming out of the side. We'll talk about those a little bit more in detail in a little bit. Then we come around to the door and we'll notice right off that it's a, what we call a rear hinge door, sometimes referred to as a suicide door. So when you open up the door, it opens from the front and opens like this. It makes getting in and out of the car very easy and very comfortable. Cord was also the first car to not have exposed door hinges. So you'll see they're all neatly hidden behind the door panel itself. Towards the rear of the car, where we notice the very graceful rear fenders, you'll notice that the front leading edge is a very nicely polished rock guard to protect the fender. You will notice as the fender swoops up and over, very similar to the front fender, that there's a very crisp crease at the top leading edge, which almost comes to a point at the very tail end of the fender, here again giving the car a very graceful and sporty look. As we follow around further around back behind, we'll get to the trunk area. One of the things that we notice on the cord is that the tail lights are recessed. It was very common for cars of the 1930s for the tail lights to sit on a pod or above and not be incorporated into the body style, so the cord has a very elegant recessed tail light treatment. We'll also notice the beautiful chrome bumpers on these cars with the chrome bumper guards. Beautifully done and stylish. Cord was also the first company to incorporate a locking gas cap uh, on their cars, which you can see here located next to the trunk opening. Another feature on the 1936 and 37 cords are the very beautiful polished full disc wheel covers. One of the things that you will also notice are the numerous holes surrounding the wheel cover. These were put in there to help cool the brakes. It was found out when cords were first built that the brakes were getting hot. So uh, they designed uh, these wheel covers to have some openings in them for ventilation and people loved the way they look. So even though they corrected the brake issue with heating up, they left the holes in there for the 1937 model just to carry on that feature that everybody thought was very elegant and sporty. Cords starting in 1937 were available in a supercharged engine, and this car is a supercharged engine. You can always tell the supercharged cars because they have these massive uh, flex pipe, polished pipes coming out of the side of the hood, diving into the front fenders, and then underneath the car. If they don't have those pipes, then you know that the car is not a supercharged cord. 
Cord was also the first car company to have retractable and closed headlamps, as you can see here. And each one was operated separately. There's a handle on the dashboard on each side of the car, and one on the driver's side, one on the passenger side. They're very similar to crank up windows. These would operate with a crank on each side, which we'll demonstrate. You will also notice the parking lamps, these yellow parking lamps or fog lamps. Those were an accessory uh, that were available on cords, and this one happens to have that feature. Also notable on the 1936, 1937 cords was the absence of running boards. With the unique transmission set up on these front wheel drive cars, the cars could sit lower, alleviating the transmission hump, which alleviated necessity for having to have running boards to be able to get into the car. This was very unique for the cars of the 30s not to have running boards. Being a two door sportsman cord, this car is a convertible and uh, true cord stylish touch. Uh, the entire convertible top is concealed under this very nicely done uh, body panel here which blends in with the trunk when the top is fully retracted down. To open up the top you simply release these lashes on each side and then you would lift up and this panel will lift up. You pull the convertible top up, latch it, and leave them the back up. Drop this panel back down and then the top will come back where the back window sits on this, locks onto here. And then this would then serve as a package shelf if you wanted to put something on there. Um, but then when you go to lower the top down again, here again, you'd lower, bring this up, lower the entire top back down, bring this panel down over the top and secure it. And then that uh, um, makes a very nice, smooth contour from the transition to the trunk. The dash on the 1937 Cord is a statement of elegance and sportiness and very aircraft stylish. We look at the engine turn panel on the back and the full array of gauges. Starting off here on the far left, we have a water temperature gauge. One of those is very similar to a thermometer. There's a little red uh, uh, color in there and as that rises, that will tell you your water temperature is rising against the numbers there on the gauge. Up here, we have our traditional speedometer from zero to 150 miles per hour, uh, which is unique because the cord would probably go about 110, 115 miles per hour top speed. Uh, incorporated into the speedometer gauge is our odometer and our trip odometer down below it. Immediately below the speedometer, we see our fuel gauge, and you see here it says empty to full and the ivory colored background. Immediately above that is another gauge that says empty to full, and that pertains to oil, how full our oil is. And that will, by simply pushing the little button down here, the gauge will switch up here to tell you empty to full. Over here is our tachometer, oil pressure gauge, clock, radio, and amp gauge. This control switch down here activates the car's heater and defroster. Simply by turning the switch, we can get different fan speeds. That will blow air out of the defroster seen on top of the dashboard, as well as down here where the heater is, simply by opening or closing these little doors to allow air to come out and be diverted. Here again, we notice the mirror on the windshield, very low positioned, but is very comfortable in its position to be able to view very well out the back. Central down here is the radio speaker, kind of hidden down in our leg area, but that is the speaker for the radio. Interesting enough, the antenna for this car runs underneath the car, so you won't see antennas rising up off the roof or the hood. This here is a lighter. So by pushing on that, then you can pull it out to light your cigar or cigarette. And down here is a little ashtray for that purpose. Um, we have two glove boxes, one on each side, that are key activated. Unique on this car that they're key activated. Most cords, they are not. They just simply pull them. These are operated with a key. Then we have an array of switches and knobs here. The far left one controls the headlamps. All the way up is off. By lowering that half down, we turn on our regular headlights. And then when we push it all the way down, we activate the bright lights on the car. 
When the bright lights are on, you'll notice this illuminated arrow that will come on on the dashboard, letting you know that your bright lights are on. So then when you turn the bright lights off, back up to the central position, that light goes out, then lights all the way off. The next toggle switch over is the gas or throttle control. So when you go to start the car, you can either use the pedal on the floor or you can simply pull this down to give yourself a little bit of a throttle. The one right beside your choke, and by adjusting your choke, uh, then you can start your car uh, with those types of settings. Some people call this an early form of cruise control because once the car is moving and driving down the road, you can actually use this to, pull, to throttle down instead of using your gas pedal and it'll say it, stay at that throttle. Um, so kind of a unique little feature on the cord. The far right switch here is instrument panel lights. All the way to the top is bright on your dash. And as you pull it down, the lights get dimmer on your gauges. A very unique feature on the cord is the pre-select transmission control. This was designed by Bendix Transmissions uh, for Hudson motor cars. Hudson in the day wanted to get the gear shift, which was traditionally on the floor, off the floor so a third person could sit in the front seat comfortably. And so we didn't have automatic transmissions in cars yet. We didn't have three-speed column shift on cars. So when Bendix designed this, it was something very special. Uh, you would shift this in a traditional pattern that you would a car sh with the gear shift on the floor, and you have a traditional H pattern for first, second, third, fourth, but you shift it with your fingers, and it shifts a little bit unique. So you go to start the car, you'd put the gear shift down here with your finger into first, and using the clutch, you would let the clutch out to get moving. Once you're moving, you do not use the clutch. You go ahead and shift it up into second. When you want to shift into second, you simply depress the clutch. You'll hear it shift, put on the clutch, and it will shift. Then you place it down into third, the same process. Once it's into third and you're ready to transmission shift, depress the clutch, let it out. Then you can go into fourth or overdrive, same procedure. And so the only time you'd need to use the clutch is when you stopped at a stop sign. You'd have to depress the clutch and use the brake or between shifts after you pre-selected. To go into reverse on the car, you'd bring the lever over, pull out on it, and pull up, and that would put it into the reverse gear, and then you use the clutch like you would traditionally on a manual transmission car. Uh, these ran through a system of electrical wires to a solenoid, to vacuum cylinders, to linkages. So it's quite a complicated system, and they were prone to being troublesome if they weren't maintained, but they did work extremely well when they were maintained and in correct operating capabilities. On the floor, we see three pedals, uh, conventional type designed for cars with a manual transmission. On the far right would be your throttle or your gas pedal. Immediately to the left of that would be your brake pedal. Then to your far left is your clutch pedal. Interesting on the cord is the clutch pedal also activates the starter on the car. So when we go to start the car, we will turn the key then by depressing the clutch, that will activate the starter. Once the car started, you can let off the clutch and it will run uh, until you need to use the pedal for shifting gears. To the left of the clutch pedal and up above is the handbrake. And simply by pulling this, ratcheting it out, will set your emergency brake. Then by pressing this lever, we'll release it to release your brake. Another lever that we find underneath the dashboard is this lever here. And by simply pulling that down, we'll open up one of the vents on top of the hood that will show you on the cowl. There's another matching one of these on the passenger side that will activate the passenger side vent on the cowl. Of course, no power steering on 1936-37 cords or power brakes, so we have large steering wheels to help us be able to turn the heavy car. And then very central to the wheel is the horn bar. By simply tapping on that, you can activate the dual horns, which are very loud and bold on this car. On the very top of the dash on each side are the windshield wiper controls. And Cord was one of the very first cars to have variable speed wipers. These are electric wipers and you would turn them on, one control for each side. And you could speed it up or slow it down by adjusting the knob here.